Have I got something for you tonight. We're going to talk about the crystal structure of gold and how that relates to things you can see in gold nuggets and things you can see around you when you're discovering gold that will tell you a little bit about the origin of gold and about things like load and plaster deposits. So let's take a look at what I have on this screen right now. This is a piece of crystalline gold. If you'll notice closely, you can see the structure of the gold. You can look around and see the, the basic uh, formation of small, tiny crystals on the surface of the gold throughout. Looks almost like pyrite, but not. Looks almost like foil, but it's not. It has these, these structures throughout, and every once in a while you'll see a little, in this case, you'll see a little chunk of remaining or residual quartz that was with the crystal because the crystal was etched out. This gold was etched out of quartz and gave, gave this crystalline structure that you see here. Notice how it's not rounded or anything like that. That's a significant thing we'll talk about in a minute. But for now, just take a look closely at the types of structures you see. You can kind of see a little bit of kind of this almost pyramid type structure throughout this thing. Little chunks that look almost cubic and, and uh, pyramidal, they call it. It's really octahedral. It's a two-sided pyramid, one stacked on top of the other. We'll talk about that in a second as well. But just kind of get used to this idea that, you know, when you're looking at crystalline gold, you can easily see these structures. Like you look over in this area here and you can see how it forms a loop. It completely loops back on itself. There's these gorgeous structures. Same thing over in here. You see all these structures and kind of almost teeth that form on the surface of this crystalline gold. Now compare that to this one. This is a, a nugget that obviously came from crystalline gold. If you look inside this area right in here, you'll see a little bit of that same kind of crystal structure. But along this surface, it's been completely worn down. There's no more crystal structure apparent. All that gold foil and everything gets pounded and pushed flush. And because gold is so malleable, you can actually, if you pound it hard enough, you can actually get it to weld back together into one mass of metal. And so what happens, they call it malleable, okay? And so what happens here is the crystal structure rapidly disappears when a nugget or when a crystal chunk of gold comes out of the load, usually in the form of float coming down the hillside, into the stream bed where it gets pounded by the boulders and cobbles that are in the stream. So the huge distinction between the two, what I wanted to call your attention to here is the following. You notice right here, there's still a little hint of the crystal structure left. That would tell me this hasn't gone too far down the stream bed. If I found one that looked like this piece, I'd be looking really close for some load gold within thousands of yards because it's not going to be much further, okay? If even, if, if even a quarter mile, a thousand yards, okay? So a thousand feet, rather. So it's going to be very, very close to where you are that the load source is going to be found unless it came out of a large chunk of float that worked its way downstream and finally broke up. That's the one exception to this rule. But if you see something this crystalline, start looking local. If you see something that has even, even this kind of hint, uh, let's see, this kind of hint right here, where you see this crystalline area right in this zone around in here, you start getting a little bit suspect because that would tend to indicate that, you know, maybe this was somewhere local or it trapped out pretty early in its history and just got pounded on one edge. A little hard to tell. But if you started seeing a bunch of them that had this kind of roughness to it and crystalline structure, then I'd start suspecting there's local, local load gold nearby. Um, that's just a tip. Let's check to make sure we're getting everybody on board. Time for everybody to <clears throat> stand in line and sound off. Not really, but <laughs> Prospector Jess's Army. Okay, so what we have here right now is seven comments, and we already have a share. All right, Vic is here. Sound is good. Video is great. Brad's here. Texas is watching. Adam's here. All right, from Alabama. Uh, Victor said, I didn't know gold had crystals. Does all gold have crystals? All gold starts as a crystal. Then what happens is when it gets broken out of the gold float, which is essentially a piece of quartz that looks something like this, and typically 
you'll find it you might find it as a as a jagged rugged piece on the edge now that would typically be because miners broke it out chances are you're not going to find much gold in it you might though just worth detecting but if you find one like this where it's pockmarked on the surface and has dark spots sometimes when you break it open you'll find those kinds of crystals like we're talking about this thing right here buried inside it'll, it'll run a thread through here at that point stop and the reason i say stop is that if there's a significant amount of gold in a rock this size and you can etch it out which means you have to have it you know typically sent to somebody who does etching because it's a very hazardous process using hydrofluoric acid uh, glass glass removal kind of process um, but it also can you know immediately kill you and and permanently damage your lungs hands fingers etc if you get even even near the vapors let alone get a drop on you so what you want to do is have somebody etch that out for you because buried inside there can be a nice big chunk like this one of crystalline gold that can be worth more than spot significantly if it's a larger piece because crystalline gold that has as much character as this one does can fetch a pretty good price and so you just want to keep your eyes out for that kind of stuff so that's a good question Dick I find a hundred in size there's typically bigger gold close by so if you find minus 100 in size is there typically gold close by not necessarily because you're you're finding really really fine gold and fine gold can travel a long distance it will travel much further than a piece like this or a piece like this one up front so so these guys would not travel very far because they're so dense and so heavy they go to the bottom find a place to hide and stay there for the rest of their lives or a good chunk of it until a piece breaks off and then that shaved off piece might be carried by any kind of motion in the water downstream clear to the ocean so there's a tremendous volume of micro micro nanoparticle gold in the ocean waters did you know that problem is it's not economically feasible yet to produce the gold that's in those waters reduce it out into gold there's just too much energy required for us too little gold returned but someday there might be some process or some side effect of of purifying water that might produce gold as a side effect and at that point it could be very lucrative because there's a tremendous volume of gold there it's just it's just so dilute and so mixed and so much volume that it makes it not very you know makes it not lucrative not valuable so um so that's kind of what we're talking about tonight so let me let me go a little further into the crystal structures now that you got me going let's go to the blackboard for a moment and i'm going to show you something that's kind of interesting first thing i mentioned was this concept of octahedral so i'm going to use my little drawing board here and i'm going to let's see what color shall i use today um let me for crystal and gold let's use gold why not so so octahedral basically think of it as two pyramids stuck on an end um, like this and i'm going to draw a dash line for the leg of the pyramid that's behind the scenes so now we got our i didn't draw that right but okay now we join them at the bottom same pattern same tip and that essentially is one form of crystal gold crystal it forms an octahedron now here's the funny part gold also likes to form in cubes did you know that we know of another natural mineral that we use daily that forms in cubes it's called halide or salt table salt to be precise so gold can also form in cubicle structures now here's the really weird part so this is hidden hey not bad now here's the weird part you can get these really strange uh structures that form a mixture of these two and so you get something that looks like and i'm going to probably not be able to do this very well at all but here it goes okay so you can get these structures that look sort of like uh think of it as a cube with a pointy end sticking out kind of thing you know and, and and some other stuff you know basically really weird looking and now it starts to look a lot like that structure i showed you that crystalline structure that i showed you early where there's just all these weird looking 
choppy patterns on the thing. They don't make any sense. Well, they do if you know that these two, kind of the cubic and the, and the octahedral gold, can combine into a structure that's a mixture of the two. And all you need is a dollop of silver and you got real trouble because now all of a sudden the silver has its own structure and pretty soon you get this muddled mess. But you kind of get the idea, okay? And that is we might end up with some, you know, some mixture of these different things. And before you know it, you get something that looks like what we saw, which is a bunch of little pieces and then little structures and little cubes. Some other stuff. The main thing I want you to note is two things. One, these structures are similar but different too because cubicle is similar to pyrite, iron pyrite, F-E-S, okay? So what you wanna look for is, does it have the property of being malleable? Is it soft? Is it dense? I mean, really dense compared to pyrite. If it is, then chances are this isn't pyrite, it's gold, it's crystalline gold. But that's where that thing would come from. It's sort of a mishmash of all of these different structures into this one blob that forms deep in the earth in the middle of a bunch of, you know, I'm gonna draw this in, uh, I don't know, blue, okay? Uh, middle of a bunch of quartz, okay? So somewhere there's a fissure that had a, had a chunk of gold that played it out as it turned a corner, because that's usually what happens either as it turns a corner or during an earthquake when there's a sudden crushing of the quartz crystal. The quartz crystal generates what's called a piezoelectric effect. So it can generate these huge electromotive forces, these huge electrostatic charge changes that immediately will affect where gold will plate out. It will cause gold to precipitate out and form these crystal structures lickety split because it starts the seeding of the gold out of the fluids that it's buried in. It's it's going up in this fluid material. It's a mixture of water and quartz and gold and other iron and you name it, all these other metals that go along with it. And all of a sudden, boom, an earthquake happens. This piezoelectric effects cause a couple of crystals of quartz. Think of it as seeding a rainstorm. All of a sudden, the thing starts to pour out gold right where it is and the gold starts plating out. And then, of course, if you have some gold, you have more gold because you have more surface. And before you know it, you get this, this kind of crystal structure forming out of nowhere. Well, it's not really out of nowhere. It's out of the atoms that are the, the, the ions that are dissolved in that super high temperature, super high pressure hydrothermal fluid that's down deep in the earth. So what's happening now is what was dissolved into that fluid now precipitates out because of the right conditions. It's, it's perfect for that thing to crystallize and bang. Once it does, you get that. And that's kind of the story of crystal and gold. So I just thought I'd touch on that tonight. Uh, again, uh, we have our call to action. We have a sourdough miner gold prospectors collection is still on sale, but it's gonna be gone here shortly. So you better go check that out. Um, give you an alert, cause it's gonna go away on Monday. And so uh, check it out. Uh, if it is there, it'll be a different price point, but it's still worth getting. So uh, this is Prospector Jess. Gold Prospector's collection or not, I'm going to show you this crystal and gold piece because I'm kind of into that stuff. Uh, now, crystals and crystal structure is a whole nother part of mineralogy and rocks and minerals. It, it plays a huge role in, in understanding how gold forms, where you can find gold, what you're looking for when you look for gold, what it is that the gold will eventually become, what it associates with. And knowing the crystal habit, that's the term they use, which is also the, the thing we used at one point to talk about the rocks associated with gold is another kind of habit, different animal entirely. A crystal habit essentially is those angles. And there's actually a whole field of math that has to do with this and they call it the crystal faces. So each face has a certain orientation and a certain symmetry, a way of either spinning it on an axis or reflecting it across the axis magical stuff and mathematically, oh, challenging. But the fact is you don't need to know all that to know about what crystalline gold looks like. I just showed you some. Just know that it doesn't always look the same. In fact, there are no two alike. That's one of the beauties, unless you find a perfect crystal of gold and then you found a real rarity. 
but the usual case is there's some oddball thing, like, for example, some of the rarest gold on planet Earth is a thing called wire gold, which is essentially a crystal that forms in what we call a laminar protrusion. It essentially forms on a surface outside that, that quartz structure and sort of almost exudes. It squeezes out of that because of how the crystal forms. It forms in one layer and then pops the next layer up, pops the next layer up, and each layer forms and that thing forms its own little crystal structure and it can be gorgeous and complicated. Just recently they did some studying of a of the largest wire gold uh, sample. It was a, a, from a museum I believe at Harvard and they took this thing cross country. Now to give you an idea how rare this stuff is and how valuable it is, they did not reveal what it was worth even in the article but they did not reveal what it was worth to the insurance companies other than under some kind of a special non-disclosure clause essentially basically determining that from state to state to state the insurance policy would cover differently as this thing worked its way from from essentially from the museum to the los alamos laboratory where they tested it using using some high energy uh, i believe it's protons to test the crystal structure here we go again and what they found blew them away. And that was this concept that they thought it was lots of different crystals running in parallel. No, it was one massive crystal growing from one surface. That's what they found. Very different from wire silver, which grows from those massive chunks of silver. And you can tell that they're different crystals by how the protons shoot through the material. So that the gold itself shot those, those protons reflected out of that stuff as such that there was just one big long prism of silver I mean of gold and that's just you know mind-boggling it, it threw them because then that changed the whole way they thought the crystal and gold had formed it also changed some uh, some things they began to realize about the age of gold and other factors that they'd long since assumed so it just shows to go that <laughs> you never know what's going to change about what we know about gold you know, that was just a few years ago they did that, if, if not even a year ago. It was not very long back, you know. So this is one continuing scientific challenging area. And I, I kind of love it. Crystals are neat. They are complicated, though. So don't get, don't get fooled by it. Just enjoy the beauty of them and understand they're extremely valuable and a lot of fun to deal with. Uh, you know, it's something that you want to kind of keep your eyes out for. If you can get a chance to collect a sample or two, you should. Uh, just be ready to pay a little bit of money for them. Uh, if you find one yourself, more power to you. And then if you find a really big one, as I said about the one from Harvard, you know, that one was discovered in 18, in the 1890s, I believe it was, in Colorado, of all places. A place called, uh, I want to say the Gold Hog Mine, but I, I can't remember whether that's right or not. But anyhow, <laughs> so that's it for tonight. Prospector Jess. Over and out, I'll catch you tomorrow. Like I said, check out this Gold Prospector's Collection offer. It's still available, but it won't be for long. So see you then. Good night and good prospecting. Over and out.